spin out. So, can you guys see my screen over here? Let me pull up the chat for a minute. Are, are you guys seeing that? Can someone confirm that for me, please? Thank you. Uh, so what we are gonna do, uh, I'm gonna skip here the asset tracking part of that and uh, go on homework to review uh, and then Gary can take on from that. Uh, first of all, uh, homework two was graded. Uh, I think I uh, encourage you guys uh, to double check that with the answer key. And please feel free to uh, email me about like anything if uh, it's not uh, clear why you got a grade or something. Uh, so feel free to do so. And in fact, I encourage you to do so because uh, you can double check if you didn't do any mistakes while grading, okay? Uh, so what I'm gonna start uh, doing here, I'm gonna start with question one on homework three. Uh, let me see if I have another announcement to do as far as homework, uh, I think so. But feel free to uh, type any question or interrupt me as we go, okay? Uh, so for question one here on homework three, uh, we we gave you guys here the four. The TFS class is so fucking hot. Oh, oh, oh. The guys... class is so fucking hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think someone is talking, but uh, so we gave you guys here the four four sectors that uh, we worked on last week, all those different years here. Uh, we asked you to calculate mean, deal mean, and standard deviation, and sharp ratios. Uh, by now, you should already like know how to do that, but just like as a refresher. So the mean is simply the average of the returns, which you'll do that straight on the returns. Geo means to calculate the geo means because we gave you returns and not adjusted flows price, you would just add one to all the, the returns here. So I just add one and, and drag it to the side, drag it down. Uh, and then I can run the geo mean formula on this added one interval, okay? So just a, as a refresher, we, we add one to the returns because the geo mean formula won't take any negative numbers, right? Uh, and then after you do that, you run the geo mean on this added one uh, uh, returns and subtract one here uh, after all, so you can get the geo mean. Remember, as a refresher as well, always the geo mean will be uh, lower than the mean. So if you got a, a geo mean that is higher than the mean, it's uh, chances are that it's wrong, right? Because if the asset or the returns have any uh, small, but uh, any standard deviation or volatility, that will lead uh, geo mean to be la la lower than the mean, right? So it's always gonna be lower. Uh, standard deviation, uh, it's just a standard deviation formula on the returns here. Again, if you use uh, the other interval that you added one, you should get the same standard deviation because you just added one, you didn't change the distribution, but uh, you should just run uh, the, the standard deviation on the regular returns to do that, although it will be the same result, okay? Uh, and sharp ratio is just the uh, returns. And uh, again, like uh, when, you when we say returns and we do that a lot of times, I know, uh, if you do have geo means, geo means will always be preferred than the mean, okay? So if you say, oh, we use the returns, you're gonna use the geo mean, okay? Unless you don't have it, then you can calculate it, then you can use the mean, or if we say use the mean as return, okay? Otherwise, you will always uh, use geo mean as a return measure, okay? So it's just the sharp ratio, the geo mean minus the risk-free asset return, divided by the standard deviation, right? So you should be able to do that. I'm not gonna go over all four here, but uh, try to double check it. Uh, then we, we ask you to calculate the correlation coefficient between them. Again, just correl and highlight the interval here between those assets, right? Uh, so it's the correlation between the returns that we are interest, interested in. Uh, you should be able to find that uh, matrix uh, correlation matrix. 
And then for question three, uh, what I'm going to be doing here with you guys, I'm going to uh, be doing like redoing it from scratch here from with you. And what I want you guys to pay attention here while I'm doing that, and feel free to interrupt me, is I want you guys to have the intuition behind it, okay? Uh, for midterms or finals, we are not going to ask you to run again this uh, solver thing. And probably in real life, you're going to somehow also like, make an automatic process to do that either on Python or on Excel. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you guys did Ace uh, 446 with Sherrick. Uh, one of the, the, the lectures is uh, about getting a macro set up to uh, run a EV Frontier. I don't know if you did remember that was like quite a long uh, programming thing, but uh, in practice, you're gonna be doing that somehow already automated. Uh, so I want you guys just to understand the intuition behind it, right? So what we have here on the EV, uh, this EV solution uh, sheet is just uh, imagine here a uh, calculator of portfolio returns and standard deviation uh, among five assets, okay? So first thing that you should, should be doing here it's uh, telling solver, telling here the, the spreadsheet, which are the expected returns and standard deviation of those five assets, okay? Expected returns will be the geo means, remember? So you could have just like type equal, geo mean here or copy and paste and, or whatever, but you should get uh, here the returns, expected returns, the geo means, and the standard deviation of those assets. We don't have five, the fifth asset, so it would be just zero, zero, and we're gonna address that uh, on solver constraints, okay? Same thing here for the correlation coefficient. You should be able just to copy that and paste here as values, okay? Uh, once you've done that, basically what it's doing over here, I'm gonna try to, uh, hope it's not gonna be like two, probably will, but I think it's gonna be helpful. Just a uh, graph here, right? The standard deviation and returns, like the returns here. What this spreadsheet is doing here is, uh, okay, you can put weights manually here, but what we're gonna be doing is using Solver to figure out uh, the weights that we want for a certain level of returns. Uh, we, we wanna solve it to solve it, for the, the level of returns that have the minimum variance that I'm gonna try to explain that. You could have like played with that. And let's say here, uh, I have this set here, 10% of asset one, 50% on asset two, and 40% on asset three. And over here, you're gonna see the answers. So the, the expected returns and standard deviation of this portfolio. So for instance, this guy here, uh, if I mix those assets like that, I'll have here 11.7 and 16.7 returns. So this will be like where my portfolio here will be, right? I could have like, I could just keep changing it and adding more and less uh, combinations here. So this time is 11.3, a little bit lower and 17. So it's over here somehow, okay. So I could have like done it like a lot of times, try to figure out what would be the standard deviation and expected returns of that, right? However, what we are doing here is we are gonna run solver to figure out for a level of benchmark return, the minimum variance uh, of that, right? So to do that, you could leave any weight over here, right? And then I'm gonna launch solver here. I think by now you guys should be able to, uh, sh should have it already like installed, the add-in uh, on your computer. But I'm gonna reset it and do that again with you guys. So what we wanna do actually is tell Solver. Oh, by the way, uh, over here the variance, it's calculated automatically here with the covariance matrix. Uh, standard deviation is just the square root. And this is just the sum of those weights over here, okay? So the sum of uh, assets over here should equal one. So we're gonna tell us over here, all right, we want the minimum variance, right? The least risk. So we want this cell here, the variance of the portfolio to be the minimum. 
by changing the weights, right? And you could have, could have selected these five asset weights or just four, doesn't matter. However, if you do have the fifth asset included, you wanna add a constraint and we're gonna be doing that, that says, I want my fifth asset to equal zero. Because if you don't, uh, if I just highlight those five and hit solve here, it's gonna, be, it's gonna return zero. And uh, hopefully it's clear why is it gonna return zero? Because you're telling Sober, okay, I want the minimum variance and you can use any of those assets. And Sober is saying, okay, if you want the minimum variance, you should not invest in any. Therefore, your risk is gonna be zero, right? That's why it's all zeros. It's not an error. It's actually, actually what you told Sober to do, right? Just minimize my variance. And he's telling like, okay, if you want the minimum variance ever, do not invest at all, <laughs> right? Uh, but it's not what we, earn. we, we want. Uh, so we're gonna add some constraints to that model so we can tell Sober uh, what we wanna do. So first of all, we want the weights here uh, of each asset to be greater or equal to zero. And in practice, I don't know uh, how familiar you guys are with investment and everything, we could short assets and have a negative weight but we're not going, gonna uh, be dealing with that over here, right? Uh, so first constraint done, you're gonna be adding more here. So second one, greater or equal to zero. Third one, greater or equal to zero. Fourth one, greater or equal to zero. And if you highlight, so I'm gonna hit okay here, okay. okay. If you, uh, here on the variable, the changing variable cells, you just highlighted the, the first four, you didn't even have to add any constraint here on the, the fifth asset. However, if you have those five here, you are also gonna add, okay, I want the last one to be equal to zero, because if you leave it uh, greater than zero, the minimum variance of that is gonna be all on the fifth asset, right? Because it has zero standard deviation here. Does that make sense? Right. So I'm telling, I'm just talking here. So uh, feel free to interrupt me if that doesn't make any sense at all or if you have any question, okay? So, okay, we, we told Sober, okay, the fourth, uh, first four weights has to be greater than zero and the fifth has to be zero, right? Uh, now, if you solve here, you're gonna find zero because there's, uh, yeah, of course. Still all zero because like he's saying, the minimum variance is zero. So you should add another constraint here. So it says, okay, but I want my money invested in those assets. So the sum of the portfolio weights should equal one, right? So in other words, like I want my money allocated there, right? Uh, if I do that, and I, I know there's more constraints here, but if I do that, the answer is over here. And it's saying the minimum variance that you can have allocating 100% of your money on that, uh, those assets is this result, right? I'm gonna just quickly draw that on the, in green here. So it's like 11.7, 16.7. So it's kind of like where we were here, kind of. This is here. However, to draw the EV frontier, uh, we want to go like a little bit further and have the minimum variance for a bunch of different uh, returns, expected returns. So the way to do that, uh, you run Sover, where's that, Sover? And you're gonna be saying, uh, I want also at least this amount of return, right? So I'm gonna say I want a return greater or less than this benchmark, okay? This is what we are gonna be adding here. So I'm gonna uh, solve and, and I'm gonna just delete that. Uh, okay, so we can tell Solver, okay, if I want a 15% a year of returns, what should be the combination? If I want like 12% or at least 12, which the combination I should use? And to draw the EV frontier, what we're gonna be doing, it's always, we're gonna start with the, the asset with the highest return. Why? Because it's the highest return that we can ever have uh, without shorting uh, using that combination, right? So 
Uh, the first time here, I'm gonna just copy this as the benchmark, and I'm gonna solve over here. So I'm, I'm telling him solver, I want uh, the minimum variance, and I want at least 12.478 uh, point of return, okay? When I solve that, uh, let me see what I have. Oh, you know, you have to add one and it's not greater than, right? And the eight, yeah, I want the expected return of the portfolio to be greater than the benchmark. That was my mistake. I'm gonna solve that. There you go. So this is your initial uh, point here. I'm gonna just copy and paste down. So the answer here, basically Silver is saying, okay, if you want uh, this amount of return, the only way that you can do that is have 100% of your asset or your money on asset two, right? And indeed it is, right? Because uh, it's the only, if you remember the, the weighted uh, average of the returns of the assets in a portfolio is equal to the expected return of the portfolio. So this is the highest that we can have here. So it's 12.5 and 18. So it's gonna be somewhere like here, I don't know. Okay. And now uh, what we said here in question one is uh, go from the maximum return to the lowest return in 0 0.0025 increment. So uh, what we meant by that is, okay, now what are you gonna be doing uh, basically, we're gonna take uh, minus 0 0.0025 here. And for this level of return, I don't know, I want Sober to get the further to the left that I, that, I, that I can, right? So I'm gonna be doing here equal minus 0 0.0025. This is my new benchmark. So I would run Sober again. The constraints are already set. Okay, this is my second solution. And it's saying, let me put that as now this so. It's saying here, okay, for that level of benchmark, 12.23. Uh, the lowest, the minimum variance that you can have is 17.67. So remember that was 18.96. So he's saying, okay, if you want a little bit less of return, the minimum variance that we can have is this point over here, which is 17.67, uh, right? So you would keep in doing that uh, and to, on like those increments that we said until you eventually, so like 0 0.0025, I'm gonna run this over again. Okay, found different solution here. So for that level of return, well, you could just do the same here. So now I want 12%, so it's a little bit lower here, 12. For that level, uh, I can have 16.91, so it's somewhere over here, right? Uh, I'm gonna do that again a couple of times. So again, I'm gonna take Minus 0 0.0025 here. Solve that again. And I do that. Uh, I can lower a little bit more my, uh, my return to 11.7. And I'm here on the initial point that we, we were over here. Now, uh, I'm gonna do that just one more time. I'm drawing. And data, it's over. And now I did it. Uh, and you see that the, the answers, they didn't change anymore, right? Hopefully you noticed that. Uh, I'm gonna just, so it's exactly the same, see? And that's not an error or anything. Basically what, what it's saying over here is, uh, okay, because we said that the parameters here, the constraints that we want at least this amount of return, 
uh, and the minimum variance. So like if we pick 10% over here, let me put 10% after here. It's saying uh, I want at least 10% with the minimum variance. So for that level, can I go all the way to the left? And it over is basically saying yes, the, all the way to the left, it's where you have actually more returns than this benchmark, right? So it's basically saying uh, if you want at least 10%, you should have 11.7% and 16.65 or 0 0.1665 uh, standard deviation here, which is your minimum variance portfolio, right? When the standard deviation stops decreasing, is where we reach here the minimum variance portfolio. And sorry, it's not on scale and anything here. But then we could have just draw the EV frontier here. Some of you did some graphs, I think, on that, uh, which is uh, probably better than just draw. But um, the intuition behind, I hope you guys got it, right? So if you want less return over here, and we didn't add uh, the mi minimum variance constraint, probably this would be coming like, will be somehow bending to the right. Somehow that if I am here, all the way to the, the left, it, it, it will go over here. It will stop over here. Does that make sense to you guys? What, what we were doing here with this EV frontier? Can someone type yes, if yes, please? Cause Oh, and Gary, hi. <laughs> I'm here. Okay. So, so is it clear to you guys? Uh, do you want me to go over that again or re-explain this ugly kind of graph, but I hopefully useful to understand the intuition behind it? Make sense? Okay, good. Uh, if not, please let me know when we can go over that again. But again, the intuition of that is very important, okay? If you wanna use Solver, Python, or other mechanisms to do that, that or do it by hand, that's okay. But uh, I hope it makes sense that even if you decrease returns here, the minimum variance will yield 11.7%, and that's why it doesn't change anymore, right? Okay. Uh, so that was question one, right? And then we asked to calculate the Sharpe ratio over here. And once you're here on this uh, EV frontier, if you don't have any uh, risk-free asset here or bonds or anything, uh, you would use that, the max sharp ratio point. And remember what uh, Gary told us, that for instance, this is the max sharp point and this is the risk-free asset. Then you would draw a line over here. And that would be your, some, your portfolio would be somewhere over here, right? Depending on your risk preferences. If you have already a bone over here or like a risk-free kind of asset for you here, then over here will be your risk preference. Uh, you would choose your level of return for the, the level of uh, standard deviation that Matches, matches your uh, risk aversion or closing, okay? So that was question one. Uh, for question two, uh, we introduced you a new concept called beta. And uh, it's very important again to get the intuition behind. Also there is the formula to calculate, but uh, the intuition is, is more important, right? So we gave here on data uh, three assets, Norwegian Cruise Lines, Walmart and Vanguard 500 index fund. Uh, we said here, treat this uh, Vanguard fund as the market, right? And we ask you to calculate betas for them, uh, geo mean means and geo means and annualize it. And finally calculate the cap M expected returns of that, right? Uh, so questions one and three are kind of like, uh, they could have be like three before because you're gonna be needing that to calculate beta, right? Uh, so first thing that you're gonna be doing, I'm gonna start on question three here. Mean, geo, mean, and standard deviation. Uh, 
So to calculate the monthly returns here, you would just use the adjusted close price. So it's, uh, for instance, on March over here, uh, 2013, it's just this price over uh, the previous price minus one, okay, to calculate the monthly return. And again, this is just a simplification. You could have, uh, so like March, or I'll put like, uh, let me do it better, but just put it over here. You could have done just equal, the adjusted close price minus the previous one and divide by the first one is the same thing. So uh, the minus one there is not nothing related with geo mean at all. It's just a simplification of that. Okay, so you you should have that. Uh, so I'm calculating the difference here monthly. So I get the monthly return uh, for the Vanguard fund. Remember, I think it's pointed out in the question. Uh, it starts on 2005. So you should start here on the same date, 2013, right? You could, you could have deleted this data here that you're not gonna be using or done as I did. And you should get those results over here. Okay, monthly results. Uh, with that, we have here means, which is just the average of those returns. For geo mean, uh, you could have uh, just added one to all of them and calculated, right? As, as uh, question one, you could have done it. Uh, but that would be exactly perfectly fine. But I use here the formula on the adjusted close price. So remember, uh, you can get just the last adjusted price divided by the first adjusted price. Uh, raised to one uh, divided by n minus one and n is how many periods you have uh, in there so it's the count of all the months minus one because we are looking at monthly right uh, intervals you should uh, re you should get the same result okay and by the way this is clear like a very good uh, explanation why geo means are preferred if you do use mean here, you might say like, okay, Norwegian yield, uh, yielded positive returns. Although if you do the geo mean, it's negative, right? So uh, it's a very good example of the, the, the geo mean versus mean here. Uh, then the standard deviation, just the standard deviation over the returns. So uh, column A, B, so I'm using those returns over here. Okay, uh, and then for betas, uh, if you remember the formula over here, the, over here, so the correlation coefficient uh, times the standard deviation of the asset divided by the standard deviation of the market. Uh, so what I'm doing here, it's uh, getting the correlation coefficient, which is here on data calculated. So on this asset and the market, okay, times. Uh, it's the standard deviation of this asset divided by the standard deviation of the market, okay? And uh, Remember, we are using this as the market. That's why we are uh, using that one. Same thing for Walmart. And for the, the, the VFINX here, because it's the market, uh, you don't even ha uh, need to do the calculation, okay? Because uh, it's gonna be one. If you think about it, the correlation coefficient between it and itself is gonna be one. And because uh, it's standard deviation is the same, as the market, because it's the market, is gonna be one as well. So it will yield one either way, or you could, you could have just type one as I did here. Uh, it's a good interpretation of that. And, and I ask it, where the betas rank is expected and why? 
So uh, it's, it's very important to have this beta concept, like the, the intuition behind it clear. Uh, so I'm going to quickly go over here, uh, you know, furnace and CLL. Just so I can make a uh, comparison real quick. Very low. I'm gonna add a comparison here with Walmart. Okay. And I see in P500. Maybe I can go out. Okay. Uh, so it's missing one. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So good intuition of that. So we have here the orange line, which is the market. Uh, look at when market are going up. Walmart, which is the orange, is kind of going up, like following the market, but not really, right? There's ups and downs here. But if you think on this period over here, uh, let me try to, I put here market. Now, you can see that it, the Norwegian here has a greater slope. So when market during that period were doing good, kind of Norwegian was doing even better, right? Uh, then the opposite also happens here on COVID, COVID and uh, this other term over here. Uh, when market suddenly dropped here in orange, Walmart didn't drop much and Norwegian like fall like very much, right? So you can see that Norwegian is very sensitive to the market. I think this is a good interpretation of uh, what beta is. So uh, you can tell here uh, beta equal one is equal to market. If beta is greater than one, it means that this asset is sensitive to market movements. So uh, its returns are amplified by market movements. If markets are doing good, usually this asset we're gonna do be, be doing even better. And the same, the opposite is also true. If markets are crashing, Probably this asset is very sensitive to that, so it will crash as well. And then the question where the, be the beta is ranked as, as expected and why? Uh, it, I mean, this is my words over here, but you could kind of like have this intuition behind it that it was expected, right? Just thinking on the kind of uh, business that Norwegian has, how sensitive it is to the economy overall. And Walmart, on the other hand, um, even if the economy is bad, people will be buying food, right? So it's less sensitive to the market. So uh, this is kind of the intuition behind uh, beta, right? Uh, so it's very important to have it. And finally over here, uh, oh, we ask you to analyze those returns. Uh, so both means and geomeans and standard deviation. Remember, uh, this is monthly data, monthly returns. So if you wanna go to monthly uh, to years, and equal 12. So uh, you will use the formula one plus the return, the monthly return raised to 12 minus one for both returns. The standard deviation is the square root of n or 12, right? So you just multiply that. And the sharp ratio, always use geo mean and minus the risk-free asset divided by the standard deviation, right? So I think someone asked, Less weak uh, if a sharp ratio could be negative, and here we are. Oh, so we can. Uh, finally, here we ask you to calculate the annual expected returns uh, using the CAPM pricing model. So, if you remember what CAPM is, uh, let me try to open over here. Thanks. Over here, uh, we had this equation uh, over here. I'm just trying to paste there, sorry. So this is the, the equation on CAPM. And basically what it says is, uh, all, remember that there's a part of the risk that can be diversified on a, well, a very well diversified portfolio. And there's a part which is the non-diversifiable, the market risk that cannot, right? And this is the kind of risk that uh, 
that investors should be rewarded for. And this is beta, right? So in summary here, CAPM says uh, the expected return on an asset, a project or something, uh, just it's a matter of uh, how risky is the asset comparing to the market or market here excess returns over the free rate and added the free rate over here, right? I don't know if it makes sense, kind of what I said, but basically for CAPM, just beta matters, right? Beta should define the expected return of an asset. And it should be able here to uh, get a uh, plug, just numbers here on the equation. And so the risk-free asset, which is over up here, 3%, plus beta of this asset, we just calculated that, times the return, on, uh, the expected return of the market. Remember, uh, the vanguard is the market, geo means, because we have geo means and the annual expected return. So you should use the annual geo mean. That was this annual. This is why annual is over here. Uh, so the annual excess returns of the market over the risk free rate. So minus over there. And you should get this result. And you should be able to just drag it down. And the only thing that matters again on these three formulas, I locked uh, risk free uh, asset returns and market returns because just the beta matters, right? So if you look at that, the region should uh, have, uh, we, we predict according to its riskiness uh, compared to the market or its beta, it should have used like very positive uh, results, right? It did not clearly, <laughs> but that's what it, it should have according to the CAPM pricing model, okay? Uh, Walmart, on the other hand, because it's uh, less sensitive to the market, you could have, you would expect less uh, returns of that, okay? So uh, in fact here, if you look, Walmart uh, exceed, exceeded uh, returns here compared to the CAPM ex expected returns. And the market will have just, of course, the, the market uh, returns because uh, beta is equal one, okay? So uh, any questions here on question two? Or, like despite the formulas and everything, I hope that is clear. Like when we say like, okay, well, CAPM expected returns or uh, betas, like this is, uh, if I give you guys beta, can you kind of guess if this asset will, you would expect this asset to have a higher or lower return comparing to other assets beta or other asset, right? So this intuition uh, should be clear by now. Okay, and uh, I hope you guys, don't have any question here or do if you do like please say so no okay uh, so finally here what I quickly want to show you uh, as I said it's uh, in practice you're not gonna be running like line by line and it's over uh, to find out the the like each uh, each minimum variance portfolio for an expected return. So th this is just a quick illustration here. This is Python uh, that you're gonna be like just basically interpreting that. And I have here a bunch of assets. Okay, this is a bunch of like e ETFs and uh, in fact, bond is over here. This is a bond ETF. Uh, Intel is here, I just pick like randomly. Uh, and you get like those returns uh, eventually from Yahoo Finance or if you have your own benchmark, your own data set, you're gonna be using that. Uh, this is the correlation matrix. So you see here that SLV, it's a silver uh, ETF that invests in silver. Uh, bone over here, you see that lower correlation with the others, uh, but then we can expect, uh, we can run like several uh, expected returns models. Like you, we could use this mean returns, uh, like historical. So it, basically this is what happened, but we could use also uh, CAPM returns to predict or to, uh, so like we could have, this is CAPM returns here. Uh, so we're just calculating the betas. So this is, those asset betas and based out of these betas is calculating this expected return. 
And then you could add uh, constraints are not your model and simply like press enter and you have here the EV frontier with all the asset plotted. This is the weight of the portfolio with the maximum sharp or if you want like lowest variance. So this should be your allocation uh, over here. Uh, and this is just getting the number of shares that you should buy of each one. And this is actually just showing you guys that in practice, the intuition is what matters. Okay, you, you, you need to be able to understand like what is the EV frontier, how it was calculated at some point. <laughs> and because really uh, the assumptions that we are doing here need to hold, right? So basically will this asset based, if you use like, I don't know, five, two years of data and put Tesla there and Amazon, do you think that the result here will be like kind of uh, representative? Like is there those returns that they got from this year, for instance, are they're gonna be sustained in the long term? So uh, these are assumptions that you're doing, but basically for every assumption that you're doing, you are maximizing your reward to risk uh, ratio here and drawing this efficient frontier. Of course, this is, if you believe, the markets are efficient, but uh, this is just an illustration of, in practice, how you're probably gonna be doing that, okay? So any questions or comments over here or? Okay, uh, so I'll go back here, Gary, I just updated those. Uh, so do you wanna get your screen back and share in your computer or leave it here? I'll take, take over the computer. Oops, am I, are you hearing me yeah. <laughs> by the way? No, I all right, know. good. Good, uh, good afternoon all. I am going to share my screen as soon as I figure out how to do that. There it is. And that's now your, sh that's not what you want to see. There, you should be seeing our, uh, our, uh, our uh, results from our asset tracking. And now I lost the chat box. How do I get the chat box back? I would like you to tell me, so last week, we saw the S&P 500 go from 3426.96 down to 3340.97. It fell 2.51% during the week. Type in the chat box why that happened or what the news said about why that happened. I'm gonna try and find my chat box while I'm doing this. There it is. No, I don't see it. Huh. There it is. All right. So type in your chat box. Why did that happen? All right. Give me some reasons why you put in your news. We saw the S&P 500 fall last week. So what were the reasons for the fall last, last week in the S&P 500? And it fell from three, four, two, six, two, three, four, four, oh. All right, thank you, yes. And then, let me keep here. We saw, I'm gonna make a list here, which we all saw, falling tech stocks, higher employment numbers, employment numbers, came out last week, yes. What else? Did anybody else list something? There was a, yes. Which, by the way, this one, if we're looking at employment, as employment goes down, as employment numbers go down, we would expect, it's sort of a, a uh, it's sort of a, all right, first off, if employment numbers are going down, we're seeing less, less economic activity, but also we are seeing um, 
seeing less disposable income out there. So it's sort of a self-fulfilling so self-fulfilling prophecy. We, we need employment to get income out in the economy. And if we don't have employment, we have lower economic activity, which will be, lead to lower, lower income as well. Falling stocks, anything else that anybody wants to mention as far as that happened last week? Um, what, did, what else did we see, see out there in the economy that might have had an impact on our S&P 500? Down, it fell 2.551%. And, and let me, I want to do uh, a couple of things here. Number one, I want to go to Yahoo Finance. I'm going to Yahoo Finance, and we've seen this. This is falling tech stocks. All right. Why is this important? And I'm going to give you a feel for why it is important right now. But as you remember, if we look at, yeah, at, at the S&P 500, our four or five largest market cap stocks are tech stocks. They're Apple, they're Facebook, they're Amazon. And I'm going to show you what has happened to the stock price of each one of these. And I'm going to start with, we're on Yahoo Finance here. We're going to do Apple. So here's Apple. And I'm going to put over here. I'm going to do a spreadsheet. All right, so we got Apple here and I'm gonna do a historical data. And I'm gonna do it, all right, we have data from September. Our last closing price on, on Apple was September 17th. And that number was 106.69. So our close, adjusted close was 106.69. Now let's go back pre-COVID, March 1. And this is going to be Apple. So I'm going to take the adjusted closing price on uh, March 1. In March 1, we had 71.93. All right, that's roughly six months ago. Percent, and I'm gonna just put percent change here. All right. And as we're looking at percent change, we are going to go September 17th, 106. 71.93 subtract one, that stock has gone up 48% in that period. Let me show you, uh, let me put a percent here and let me do another one. And I'm just gonna do Amazon. If you, And I'm gonna do a couple of of um, tech stocks and non-tech stocks. So Apple, let's do Amazon as well, just to get a feel for, it isn't just Apple that this has happened to, but it's other, a couple other countries as well, uh, companies as well. Let's do Amazon, AMZN is its ticker. There's its, and you're gonna get a feel for this right there is since March to here, we've fallen trace back a little bit, but still it's overall up. This is the this right here is what we're talking about this week, the, the tech tech decline. All right, let's go to historical data. 29.961. Our 
is September 17th, and let's go to back to March 1. Oops, we gotta go back March. Actually, March 2nd, March 2nd, I'm sorry, March 2. And we have 1953 now. Point ninety five. All right. All right. And if we look at that, that percent change, we got fifty three percent. All right. You got a stock you want to look at. We can add it. Tell me what stock you're interested in. Type it in the bar and we will look at it. But you get a feel here. These are two tech stocks, and they've had 48% return. That's what the return would be over the past. The, 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 these two stocks have gone up. If you look at the price, you know they've gone up 53%. That's a very good return for a six month period. Now let's go to a non tech stock. And, and um, Oh, I don't know. Let's do Ford, for example, a car company. Probably hasn't done the best, not the worst, but let's look at Ford. Ah, City, yeah, let's do City. City's a good, good choice, thank you. And City Group, I think is, I think is C, City Group Inc. We're looking at a banking sort of system. City Group. There's what it looks like. Let's do a longer year. Boom, boom. <laughs> Not the best. <laughs> All right, let's go to the historical data. So this is the crater. All right, now let's go to historical data. We're now at 45.20. And go back here to March 2nd, 6601. You can see here that this one, uh, having slippery fingers today, down 32%. All right. Not just, and, and you can do, do this for any one of the number of stocks. Amazon, another good one. We did it, this one last week, in, last time in, in class was Tesla. Just let me give you a feel for what Tesla has done. T-S-L-A. All right. Historical data here. Four two three zero oh, four four two three zero oh, four, and then we had March third one forty nine oh nine four point nine zero. Oh. hundred and eighty two percent so what we have right now going on is sort of this divide between two different uh, two different uh, sectors of the economy and they're doing differently the tech stocks very well fortunately for our s p 500 tech stocks make up a pretty large portion of the total portfolio um, so they do they're they're they're, they're doing very, very, the S&P 500 is doing pretty well, actually, given all the COVID-19 sort of things that are going on. And our non-tech sector, Citigroup banking, car companies, you wanna see some poorer ones, look at airlines, uh, Caribbean cruise, anything that's sort of old, older, isn't doing as well. So we have this divide in the economy. And um, just a, just, so, and so I took this article, 
S&P lost for, swings of tech stocks have been particularly alarming. Also, the other thing that many people will keep mentioning is analyze. analysts are going to point to continued volatility. Somewhat surprisingly, though, our uh, VIX came down a bit, but still not as high as the week before, but still down some. So we're looking at less volatility, and there's quite a bit of difference in opinion, right? We're at a place now where we don't know what's happening, and there's a lot of dif differences in opinions in the market. So that's, as we track this uh, market, that's some of the things that are going on this, this week. All right, turn, we're, I'm going to the next page of our outline. And I have, all right, so, so if you're looking at the portfolio problem that you did this week, here's what you did. You derived your means standard deviation correlations using historical data, all right? We came up with the correlations from a historical standpoint. We then used those historical means, standard deviations, and correlation coefficients to derive our efficient frontier using this. And then we selected the portfolio on the EV frontier. That's the process of doing a, a portfolio analysis. And it's the bread and butter of what, uh, what financial planners do. They look at historical returns, say, this is what we've seen. We're going to put you into a portfolio. Um, here's why we're going to put it into your portfolio. Bang, you got a portfolio. All right. What does this step do here? If we're deriving means, standard deviations, and correlation coefficients, what sort of questions should that raise in your mind as you're doing that portfolio selection? So take a minute, write it down. If you want to put it in your, your chat box, think for a minute. But again, tell me, I think, this, may, this is a good, good exam question. What, does, what explicit assumption are you making when you use historical mean standard deviations and correlation coefficients to do this analysis? All right? What are you doing? Anybody want to venture a guess on our chat box? What do you think, what assumption are you making when you're doing that? All right. Here, all right, think about this. What you are doing is you're making an assumption that the future looks like the past, All right? You're saying I'm taking what has happened in the future as a predictor of the, fu of the future. Let me say that again. You're explicitly saying that what I'm doing is taking the past and using that as a predictor or what it looks like in the future. All right, that may or may not be a good assumption, but, and it, it, and it isn't actually a good assumption in many cases. And let, let me just give you an example here. If we take 20 years ago and see that the largest stocks, 20 years ago, the largest stocks in the S&P 500, and say, are they still doing well? And what you'll find is that the 20 larger stocks 20 years ago aren't the 20 larger stocks now, and many of them have gone bankrupt. All right, prime example of that is General Motors. It would have been large, 20 years ago would have been a, a, a large stock. All right, now all, every type of analysis that we're doing now is going to tell you that tech stocks are the way to go, right? We're going to say Amazon has had very good returns. Microsoft has had very good returns. Apple has very good returns. 
And your question then is, is that it's going to continue in the future? Is the future the same as the past? And that, in essence, if you're using any sort of historical data to make a point of looking forward, you are making that assumption that what was will be. All right? There's our portfolio model. All right. Let's move on. All right. This, all right. So I'm, I'm on our third page of our handout. And here we have four items. S&P 500, Microsoft, Exxon, Deere. Now I gave you the means, geometric means, standard deviation, and also their correlation coefficients here, okay? So that, were, that was our correlation coefficients. Means and standard deviations. And here was the question. This happens to be an old exam question. I asked you to draw an EV frontier with these three stocks, Microsoft, Exxon, and Deere. Not putting S&P 500 here. All right, so we have Microsoft, Exxon, and Deere here, and I asked you to draw a frontier. So, if you're drawing a frontier and you're looking at those stocks, you know one thing immediately. All right, and we've said this a number of times, our highest return, our highest point on our, our EV frontier is going to be the highest expected return asset. We'll invest 100% of our portfolio in this asset if we don't have a risk-free rate and the risk-free asset. And in this case, it is going to be Microsoft, okay? So, if you were drawing that frontier, I asked you to put these three assets on the portfolio. So you'd put Microsoft at the top, 0.25 return, Exxon and, and Deere would have the same returns. Exxon, so they're going to, have to be on the same vertical axis. Standard deviation is going to be higher for Deere. And then I asked you the front, if I asked you for the frontier, it's going to start at Exxon, or excuse me, Microsoft, and then curl down, All right? That is what the EV frontier is going to look like. And if I asked you to do that on an exam, I would not be expecting you to get the EV frontier right, but I would expect you to start at the, the, at the top one and then work the way down from there. I have done this and it is, actually I used our, uh, our example here. If I go back to our Compass website, oops, there it is. If I go down to our Compass website, this example, XLM, gives you the example of it. Let me pull it up here. Actually, I was working with it with our rates of changes. And if I go to the EV solution, Here is what that looks like. Okay, Exxon is at the top. It has a, a correlation coefficient, or excuse me, an expected return of 0.25 and a standard deviation of 0.35. Here is Exxon and Deere, and I just derived our EV frontier from here on down. And there's the EV frontier. Now, if I asked you to do that, let me just show you some of the things that you could have done. 
as long as you get the EV frontier to the left of this, you're gonna have it right. You could have it going out here. You could have it going out here, curving down. I would not expect you to know how that looks without running the EV solution. All right, but this is the EV solution, drive it. Here's our EV frontier. And you'll note here that we can get a 12% return, cancel, with a 0.19 standard deviation, much lower than our either our 0.2 far for uh, deer or 0.23 for um, our Deer, deer and exon here, so which are here, we can get much lower. And again, if you look at the combinations there, you're combining the two assets, and because they have a correlation coefficient that isn't isn't um, isn't one, we're pushing that EV frontier to the to the to toward to the left here. All right, here is where the S and P 500 falls on this example, but let me just change it a little bit. I actually put the, the frontier, that point is this here. And let me just make this. Oops. Yeah, I'm sorry. Now, I just changed that point, so it went up here to 0.15. Is that possible, one? Is it possible for the S&P 500 to the light to the left of a EME frontier with Microsoft, Exxon, and Deer in it? So would it be possible for this to occur? Think about that a little bit, and could you have an S&P 500 result in a portfolio that is more risk efficient than with three assets. Is that possible? The answer to that question is yes. And the reason why it is possible is because you have a great more diversification if you had included this S&P 500 into your EV analysis, you would have had a portfolio that would have went over here, okay? It would have went over here, and the reason why it went over here is because you now have another asset that you did not consider when you built that EV frontier. So, there you have the alternatives. Again, this is possible. I'm going to put this back to what it was. There is what it was. You can pull down that EV frontier and see what this example is. And again, that happens with this example right here. All right. Any questions or comments while we're while we're thinking here. All right, you're a quiet bunch today. I want to end here with our beta example, and I want to give you a bit of a bit of intuition about beta. Here's beta. Here's our calculation of beta. And I'm going to take a case, and again, I'm going to go back to my um, my spreadsheet. Here's the beta. Here's what the definition is. And I'm going to put correlation coefficient. So this is the correlation, co correlation coefficient. Uh, 
I'm going to go the standard deviation of my asset. Standard deviation. of the market. All right. Now, beta. Beta is the amount of risk that an individual asset will, will put into a well-diversified portfolio, OK? actually any the portfolio that you have constructed here beta is a measure of risk ah yes i will zoom in i will zoom in let me zoom more oops 200 all right so beta is the amount of risk that a asset will bring to a well-diversified portfolio. So we moved from a measure of risk of just straight standard deviation to thinking about it in a market portfolio case. And let me just, so I'm gonna do beta. And a beta of one, remember, one is, the market risk greater than one is more than the market risk. And for those assets, the CAPM model says, for those assets, if I have greater than one variability, I should have a higher expected return. Finance, always, you need higher expected return for the same risk. Greater than one is more risk than the market. All right. Less risk than the market. All right. Let me start out here with the case of, I'm gonna put 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So I have an asset that has the same risk as the portfolio, all right? And let me say the correlation coefficient between those is one. Boom, 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 boom. It's a market, right? It's exactly the market. And in that case, we have a, have a beta equal to one. All right, if we had any correlation coefficient that's less than one, right now it's, you know, correlation coefficient drained from one to minus one, if we have 0.8, we have a beta that is less than one, all right? Let me give you, now, now, now let me change this example a bit. Let me go one again. Now I'm gonna, like most, in most cases, our assets will have more, more risk than the market. Let's say we have an asset with 0.4. Now we have, have a, a beta of 1.36, okay? More risk than the market, this is saying. And as you're looking at it, has, has the same correlation coefficient, more risk? Yeah, I have more risk than the market. Now, let me lower that correlation coefficient. 0 0.8, got 1.08, 0 0.7, 0 0.952. All right, you think about this. 0.7 is the correlation coefficient. 0.34 is the standard deviation of the asset. This asset is actually much riskier than the market, but, or much, let me rephrase that, but has a higher standard deviation than the market, but because it has a lower correlation coefficient, we get less contribution of risk than the market portfolio. And, and if you think about that for a little while, it makes sense. I combine this asset that's more risky, but it's somewhat counter-cyclical to the market. 
I am offsetting some of the risk that is, exists in the market. That's what is going on here, and that is why we can have risk, risky assets, and let's say we have a really risky asset. Twice the, twice the market portfolio, but if it's not very correlated, 0.5, it still contributes less to the risk to the market. Now, what that also means is that if you have a portfolio, let's say you've got a client or your portfolio is, is set, and you're looking at adding assets to that market portfolio, you will not necessarily add risk to your portfolio by having put, putting more risky assets in it if you look at the correlation coefficients, right? And if you find assets that are uncorrelated, you're going to be fine from a risk standpoint. And, and, and it builds into this the intuition behind why we get very concerned about looking at the portfolio. Now you've got a portfolio you got to think about not only the risk of the assets and return of the asset, but how it is correlated with that uh, portfolio. All right, it's almost time to end. I'm going to stop here. Uh, questions or comments? Next week we have it's exam week, so get ready for exam week. Here's how the exam week will work. We will release the exam. Uh, next week, it'll be multiple choice. We will do it when, when you have time. And we will also have a, uh, have a, 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 another part of it where you'll turn it in. All right, questions or comments? Enrique, you have anything else to do? You, all right, do we have homework still? You have been, you have homework this week. That's a good question. You have homework this week because we don't have an exam, so you have homework that's due next Tuesday. But next, the week after that, you will not, and that is key, not have homework, but you will have the exam. All right. Well, how does the exam, um, is it, does it open up on the 22nd and then closes on the 29th? Uh, Enrique, do we have that all worked out? That was our plan, though, right? Yeah, yeah. We're probably going to release that. Uh, it, we, we haven't decided, but probably Tuesday after class on Compass, and you have, like, a week to do, like, multiple. Uh, you can, like, save and submit later, you know, and oh. just, like, on Compass. Gotcha. Okay. But if not, it, it's going to be, like, a week still, you know? So, like, if you release it on, uh, I don't know. Tuesday. Yeah, like Wednesday is going to be till next Wednesday. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We'll see you next week. All right. See you guys. I'll start recording.